welcome. Let's get started. So last week you had your first adaptive learning assignment in Connect, and I'd like to know how did that go for you? Good. Did it take about 90 minutes? That's how long it was set to. So su subsequent ones will be shorter. They'll be about 30 minutes. Um, now, 15 students didn't hand it in at all, and that made me worry that maybe there was a syncing problem with the grade book, but it looks like it is syncing properly. Um, since that, those assignments are worth 2%, and you, can't, you can get 100 if you keep going for long enough, uh, there, it's, it's good to do those if you can. Um, any thoughts on, on that experience or on that assignment? Did you encounter any bugs? Did you get repeated questions? It was very glitchy for last year's students, so it looks like improvements have been made. Yes? Okay. Yeah, so, so keep an eye out for that. If it happens again, and you're like, no, this is definitely a glitch, then you could say, take a screenshot. I think you can report it through their system, but um, you could also let me know and I'll pass that along and we'll try to keep that as seamless as possible. Um, quiz four, uh, the averages were about 70%, which I'm happy with. And I was very pleased that 67% um, met the criterion for satisfactory performance. We've been talking about sort of norm-based tests and criterion-based tests. And we talked about how the IQ test is a norm-based test where, where 100 uh, just means, means the average. So we don't really know what 100 means or 100 could mean different things at different times. Historically, it's meant very different things over the last 80 years, but it means um, it means kind of average. And in this kind of distribution, the mean and the median are both fall in the center of the distribution. So, um, but we can have a, a test be both norm-based and criterion-based. We can add a criterion to that. And so we can say, well, anyone who scores 85 or below has an intellectual disability. And there's, so that's a criteria, it's like a cutoff. If you take a, a, a test like the Hamilton Depression Inventory, it'll say, well, if you get a, a score of below something, I forget what it is, then that's symptoms of depression. But if your score is within this range, then you don't have symptoms of depression. The idea. And so we do that um, sort of academically with test two and according to the, the syllabus, the criterion for satisfactory performance. And I want to see all students have satisfactory performance. Anything more than that is gravy for me. I'm very happy if you get an A, but I do want to see as many people as possible achieving the 60%. So there's something a little bit arbitrary about that, right? So a bunch of people would have gotten together, maybe at academic senate, and they said 60% is satisfactory. Oh, why wasn't it 55? Why wasn't it 70? So there's always going to be some level of, of social construction. And that's the same thing with a, a clinical disorder like depression. A bunch of experts got together and they agreed that, you know, this is the definition of de depression and this is not depression. There's always going to be some subjectivity there. I was pleased to see that number jump up to 67%. And I've noticed big improvements. Like when I see somebody go from like 40 to 50 to 60, I'm being really happy. That's nice to see. Today we'll be talking about infancy and childhood and development. I will leave adolescence off until um, Thursday. Uh, this is a subject where child abuse does come up because the way we treat children can have profound effects on their development, as you might imagine. That's on slides 28 to 38 and a blue screen them. Developmental psychology is one of the major sub-disciplines of psychology. And is anyone here interested in developmental psychology? Any psych majors thinking that might be the field for you? No? Nicole Conrad, our department chair, is uh, a developmental psychologist. A developmental psychologists might specialize in all kinds of different things. Uh, Nicole specializes in literacy, but some might look at childhood psychopathology. Some might focus on adolescent development. Some might be very interested in attachment styles in infants. 
age matters, right? If I say I'm going to introduce you to, to John, you're going to meet John. I don't tell you anything about John. Okay, you know from the name that this is probably a person of the male gender. But if I tell you that John is three months old, you know a lot about John. Right? You know that, that he can't walk and he can't talk and he probably likes to stick his hand in his mouth and chew on it. If I told you that John was 30 years old, you figure that John, you know, probably has a job and you're going to be able to have a conversation. And then if John was 90 years old, you might be expecting something else, right? So there's a lot of information in age. Age is a correlate of a lot of things. So developmental psychology is the branch of psychology that studies physical, cognitive, going on your head, and social development throughout the lifespan. So from birth to end of life. Maturation is like a biological process of development that enables orderly changes in behavior. So there's a, a basic course of development where yes, there's individual differences, but we all start out as babies that learn to crawl and to walk, that go through childhood and puberty. And if we're very fortunate, are privileged to become elderly. And then we may walk with a stoop and have gray hair. And maybe, maybe some people never get gray hair, but you know what an older person looks like. And there's, there's a strong biological basis for that that accounts for the commonalities, right? Why do we all kind of develop, that's quite all right, um, sagging skin, right? There's a biological reason for that. Now, and it progresses in a way that's expected. There isn't anyone that is born a senior citizen and then develops kind of backwards into being a baby at the end of the life, right? But there's some kind of genetic biological process underlying all that. And, you know, we can use all the anti-aging creams we like. Uh, we're all gonna get older. Progeria is a condition that really highlights the biological or sort of genetic component of aging. So people who have progeria have their aging processes kick in far sooner than, than normal. It would, it would seem normal at birth, but by say the age of one, definitely by two would be apparent that an aging process has kicked in. And so the pictures there um, are of children. Those are the, the child's parents, but um, they age about 10 times faster than normal for what are genetic reasons. And they live to maybe their teens, maybe up to 20. Um, they usually pass on from cardiovascular disease, which is what most older humans die of eventually. Um, and it doesn't affect mental development. And uh, Adalia Rose there, she, uh, she's now passed away, I believe was a YouTuber. So quite interesting to go and listen to their stories. I think Sam Burns had a TED talk, but he passed away at age 17. They age very, very quickly. The big questions in developmental psychology center on the nurture versus, nature versus nurture, sorry. So we can ask, how does their genetic inheritance, how does that biological basis interact with our experiences to influence development? So we're all going to get older, but what does you know, adulthood mean in different societies? And maybe there's some societies where people are adult much sooner. Historically, like in the Middle Ages, you were probably adult at the end of puberty. Now you're not. Continuity in stages. So is development gradual or are there stages that change abruptly? Like now the child can stand, now it can walk, now it can run. And do they proceed in an orderly way? Are there any children that can run before they can stand? So the stages get at the idea of like a categorical process. Now you're at this stage, now you're at that stage. And then we can ask about stability and change. Maybe there's some way that you're you, your entire life, from the time that you're a baby to when you're an elderly person. Is there something in common? We can also ask how you change. So some traits persist through life. And an ex one example of that is um, your temperament. That's a biologically based thing. So temperament refers to 
individual differences in behavior that are biologically based and relatively independent of learning. Some babies are born being kind of cranky babies. Some of them are fussy babies. Some of them are happy babies. And I stay that way. But then there's personality and that involves learning and personality scores do change over time longitudinally. People kind of mellow out, they become more agreeable, they get more emotionally stable. Maybe your, yourself five years ago was less emotionally stable than anywhere now. Maybe some of that's learning skills like emotional regulation. Researchers who um, emphasize experience and learning tend to see development as a slow, continuous shaping process. Are you getting socialized as you grow up? And researchers who emphasize biological maturation tend to see development more in that stage-based views, the genetically predisposed series of steps or stages. Famous stage theories. Jean Piaget had one for cognitive development. We'll cover that in today's lecture. Then Eric Erickson and Lawrence Kohlberg, we will talk about next class. Eric Erickson had a stage model for psychosocial development that was kind of about personality development, how you incorporate um, conflicts between personal needs and the expectations of society. And those are different for say a, a teenager who might be trying to figure out their identity than for an older adult who's thinking about their legacy. And Lawrence Kohlberg talked about stages of moral development. So how do we understand that you should or should, that you shouldn't do something because it's wrong. A child might say, well, it's, it's wrong because mommy says it's wrong. And if you do it, you can go to your room. It's a very different level of understanding than a higher level philosophical view of morality. Okay. So nature versus nurture matters even in the prenatal environment. So there are risks in the prenatal environment. There are teratogens, which are agents like chemical or a virus that can affect the development of an embryo or a fetus. And a really common one is alcohol. We also, we know we shouldn't drink during pregnancy. We know we shouldn't smoke during pregnancy because those agents can have an effect on the developing person. So the fetal alcohol syndrome is is defined as physical or mental abnormalities in children that would be caused by a lot of exposure to alcohol. And alcohol has epigenetic effects. It affects the way genes express themselves. And the reason we're focusing on this is to say that both nature and nurture matter. So environment matters right from the start. So this dichotomy of nature versus nurture never really makes any sense. It's always both of them in interaction with each other. Babies can be born with addictions. People do develop addictions. This can be rooted in histories of trauma. So neonatal abstinence syndrome refers to when a newborn goes into withdrawal because they're no longer being exposed to the high levels of a certain substance that they'd be getting in the uh, prenatal environment. And then hospital staff would need to administer that drug and then carefully wean the baby off it. The parents would be given treatment for the addiction and appropriate social services support before the baby could go home with their birth parents. And we always hope that can happen, but sometimes other arrangements would, would need to be made for the interests of the child, which would be the determining factor. So say we wanna study psychology, it's easy to do in an adult who um, is talking to you in their office, laying on the couch while you take notes, but how do you do that with a baby? You talk to you. How might you study psychology in babies? What is anything you could do with a baby? Yes. Uh, in the textbook, it, it brought up um, eye tracking software. And, Excellent. And uh, 
Yeah, so we're looking at behaviors that they do have. They're pretty simple at this stage. It's not telling you their life story. It's looking at something. And what might we be able to discern from where a baby looks? Yeah. So things that are different. So if something kind of doesn't add up, the baby might notice it. Um, they, they look at things they like. Babies like faces. And if you give them a stimuli that looks like, or stimulus that looks like a face, they would rather look at this one and they'll spend longer looking at it than that non-face one. That tells us that we're biologically primed to like faces. And that makes sense because we're social animals. Newborns come with a bunch of hardwired reflexes that help them survive. So they will um, root around to look for a nipple. They will, um, and they suck reflexively. They, um, they grasp things. Have you ever tried that thing when you give a, a newborn baby your finger? Grab hold of it. They breathe on their own. You don't teach them that. They swallow. And they cry to get help and, and comfort. They like the smell and the sound of their mother. So if they are given images or some, I don't know, some piece of fabric scented with the mother smell, they'll always orient, preferentially orient towards that. They like sights and sounds that are linked to other humans. And they can smell and see pretty well. And they can learn. What kind of learning would you be, would you expect? a baby to have right off the bat. They can't speak, they don't have language, so you can't give them a lecture. Not like newborn, newborn, but babies do have some very basic, they might, they might have some very basic numeric abilities. I have to look into that. I think I know what, you're, what study you're thinking of. Yes. Um, they can be classically conditioned. So that implicit track, the stuff that works with sea slugs, also with babies. Um, babies habituate, that's a kind of learning. So if I were to make a loud sound, it would startle at first, might notice, but if I kept doing that, over and over, you would eventually stop responding. That's an adaptive behavior. You stop wasting your resources trying to notice what that is. And um, babies have that too. So if um, a baby is born to a mother who lived near something like a railroad crossing where there's a lot of sounds, a lot of noise, the baby will be habituated to that sound. However, if you brought in a baby to that same apartment that wasn't used to that, it might get upset by the sound of, say, the trains. They do have those simple mechanisms for learning in place. Infantile amnesia refers to our absence of memory from the first, say, three years of life. And that reflects the development of the hippocampus, which is involved in the consolidation of long-term memories. And also the fact that someone that young doesn't really have the schema to remember and classify information the way an older person does to you know, come up with coherent narratives. Um, they don't have language and your declarative memory is based on things that you can declare, make your, there's a, I had a test question on this about like your knowledge of psychology. Doesn't mean you can declare refers to your semantic memory. You don't have language, you can't really have that either. So to some extent, memory reflects language development. So I'll talk about um, Jean Piaget's theory of cognitive development, which is a stage model. Cognition, refers to all mental activities associated with thinking, knowing, remembering, and communicating. 
How is that concept distinct from the concept of intelligence? You're getting there, getting warmer. Yes. But I could say that remembering is an ability, the ability to remember. Intelligence is a way high lever, le higher level construct that is about applying your learning and memory, but your cognitive abilities in adaptive ways. It's about how you use it successfully or unsuccessfully. And you can imagine again, like everything in psychology, there's a level of social construction there to what is adaptive and what contexts and who defines the context and what success is. But intelligence goes above that, it encapsulates and incorporates things like learning and memory and cognitive ability. And then asks, how can you use this to identify problems, recognize problems, and solve problems? Jean Piaget was a French developmental psychologist, and he theorized that the mind develops through a series of universal, which means everyone goes through these stages, irreversible stages, which means that once you achieve a stage, you keep going forward, you don't go backwards again. And they develop from simple reflexes to adult abstract reasoning. Schema refer to frameworks that organize or interpret information. A child might have a very simple schema framework, like all women are mommies. Right? A child who has a mother might believe that. This is a, a woman. This is my mommy. And that child might assume that all women are mommies. So let's say that we go to the playground with mom and mom's sitting there with another woman. Well, that's another mom. And that would be an example of assimilation. So when you see that new, that woman, the mom's talking to on the playground, we'd interpret that in terms of the existing schema and assume that woman's also a mommy. And maybe she has kids there and that's true, but maybe she's not. And the child would have to accommodate their view. When I was making up this slide, my nine-year-old daughter came over and she wanted to know what I was doing. I figured she's old enough to understand this. And I tried to explain it to her and she screwed up her face just like that kid there, right? Because she didn't know that all, all women were not in fact moms. She actually believed that. It took her a minute. She was like, what? To realize that some women don't have children and are not mothers. Child might also think that their teacher is um, always a teacher and not understand that that person kind of goes home and might have their own family. Right? Children would would learn that as they get older, as their schemas, which are initially very simple, accommodate and become more complex. So the first stage in Piaget's model is the sensor motor stage. It runs from about birth to two years. And during this stage, the child experiences the world through the senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting. They're picking things off the floor and sticking them in their mouth to learn about the form of that object. They're discovering their feet and sticking them in their mouth too. Okay, they're into grabbing things. That's how they're experiencing the world, through their senses. The milestone of that stage is called object permanence. It's a very, it's a great delight to a child who is learning this. You play this peekaboo game. There's a, so if you have a, any kind of a thing, and let's say that I put this thing where you can't see it anymore, you have to have representational thought. You have to have a certain level of cognition to know that it's still there. 
for someone who hasn't reached that mind milestone, it's gone now. It can be very, very entertaining if it's there and now it's gone and now it's back and now it's gone. And they're like, wow. Once they achieve that milestone, you have some representational thought around this object. You know that it's not gone when I put it behind the back. Okay, so object permanence refers to your awareness that things continue to exist even when you don't see them. But to have that, you have to have some kind of an abstract concept of the thing. That's a, a milestone, that's a, a level of cognitive development. The next stage is called the pre operational stage. And that runs from about two to seven years old. And at this stage, uh, children are learning to use language, learning to pretend play. They can't yet perform the mental operations of concrete logic, is what Piaget would say. Um, they might understand that there's the same amount of milk in these two glasses. But if we take one of these short glasses of milk and pour it into this thin, tall glass of milk, now the child thinks there's more milk. If you have con conservation, you would know that this is the same amount of milk, it's just in a different shape of container. But you have to keep a few things in your mind to be able to do that. Like if the child is just kind of, if its mind is simple enough that it can only focus on, you know, maybe one dimension of that form, let's say height, it thinks there's more because the child's mind isn't developed enough to understand that there is a height times by width relationship with volume. They're not there yet. The milestone of this stage is theory of mind. This is the stage at which children become aware that other people have different mental states. So maybe let's say I'm calm. If I didn't have theory of mind, I would think that you are all also calm. But for me to recognize, let's say from your behavior, that one of you is anxious, I have to be able to understand that your mind is different from my own. You can perceive different things, that you can feel different things. So theory of mind refers to the capacity to understand other people by ascribing mental states to them. And those states can be different from your own states and include their, their beliefs, their desires, their intentions, their emotions, their thoughts. Really important for a social animal to be able to do that. If you can't do that, if you assume that everything that is true of you is true of others, all that egocentrism. And we're all fundamentally egocentric. Like if I try to understand you at some level, it's through my own experience by relating what I'm seeing you do somehow to states I've been in in the past. Well, when, when I've been scared, I look like that. So we remain egocentric as we get older, but we're better at correcting our perspective. But some people aren't able to do that and there are deficits in theory of mind in people with um, autistic spectrum disorder. So a child might think, let's say the child is afraid of a monster under the bed. And so the child might hide under the covers. If there's a really a monster in your room, would it actually care that you're under the covers? But in the mind of the egocentric child, I can't see the monster. So the monster can't see me. Kind of an embarrassing situation, kind of covering your, your hands like so the child might think that now the parents can't see them because they can't see the parents. That's a demonstration of egocentric, right? So the egocentric child would think that if he can't see the monster, the monster can't see him. 
we can test theory of mind. And here's an example from uh, Baron Cohen. So it's an experiment with dolls. So this is Sally and this is Anne. Sally has a ball and she puts it in the cupboard. Then Sally walks away. Now Anne moves it. She puts it in the blue cupboard. Where will Sally look for the ball? What would the egocentric child say? What would the person who has not developed theory of mind say? So let's say that we have not yet developed. No, I think you're right. So um, Sally is going to go, yeah, so where's Sally gonna go look for it, right? That tells me that you have theory of mind because you know that Sally didn't see this happen. However, a child who had not yet developed theory of mind, you might see this in, in people with ASD, wouldn't be able to make that distinction. And since you know that it's now in the blue cupboard, they would say, well, Sally's gonna go look in the blue cupboard. They don't get that Sally had a different perspective that she didn't see this. And so the person with, who's at the eccentric stage or who has not developed theory of mind would think that Sally would look in the blue cupboard because they're not able to make that distinction around different people who have different experiences, see different things, have different perspectives, have different knowledge. So that's a test. So it's around the age of four years old that a child, a normally developing child could do that. The next stage is the concrete operational stage, seven to 11 years. And this is where um, children are getting better at handling abstract concepts. Okay? Their, their ability to do simple math is developing. They doing, I don't know, maybe multiplications. They have the mental operations to let them think logically about concrete events. They can increasingly mentally manipulate imagined abstract objects. The last stage is the formal operational stage. At this point, we now have fully developed cognitive ability to engage in abstract logic. Now I imagine that a 60 year old philosopher might be better at that than a 12 year old. This is the stage at which one would reach it. Have systematic thinking, scientific reasoning. So if you think about Piaget's contributions, you can recognize that he identified significant cognitive milestones. He stimulated a lot of interest in this field of psychology. And he's basically right. right? The, the sequence of milestones unfold essentially as he proposed. But it's a little bit less um, stage-based and more continuous than he theorized. And children can be a bit more competent than he theorized, pretend play, symbolic thinking, in fact, emerge a little earlier than he thought. And he didn't really consider, he underplayed the role of teachers, parents, other adults, sort of the social basis of learning. In psychology, I, and, and even as you go into other social sciences like sociology, remember there's the theoretical level, and sometimes we talk about theories as if they're true, right? And then there is this stage from two to seven. So that's the theoretical level. Then there's the level of how has this been tested and did it actually pan out? And that's distinct. Theories sometimes don't pan out at all. 
Sometimes they are quite predictive, but rarely are theories in psychology as predictive as, say, the theory of gravity. This, this is going to work, right? It's going to, it's going to fall, and it's not going to fall up, and it's going to do that in every different society. And it'll do that in 20 years, and it would have done that 20 years ago. Theories in psychology are um, not quite like that. So keep that in mind when I talk about this in these absolutely universal terms. Often in the history of science, there's you know, two or more scientists studying the same thing without knowing it or of each other. So like Mendeley and Galton were studying heredity without knowing about each other. So Lev Vygotsky was a Soviet psychologist working on the same kind of thing at the same time. Um, and he thought about more about the role of language and culture and socialization in a child's cognitive development. Thought more about the role of parents and teachers, older adults, and supporting a learner's development and providing support structures to help that person get to the next stage. In Piaget's theory, it's like you're in this stage, you achieve a milestone, but you know you're in the next stage. And he's not thinking about how people help a child progress from one stage to another. Vygotsky theorized that the language of a child's culture is used in the child's internalized inner speech. And that by age seven, children can think through and solve problems with words. He focused on how caregivers support a learner's development. We'll talk about scaffolding. One of the things that teachers of any kind do is provide a temporary scaffold to help a child get to the next level, to help a learner get to the next level, say by breaking some, a difficult task that could seem above their ability into little chunks, then they can learn how to do it, then they can do it on their own. The ultimate goal of a good teacher of any kind is to become irrelevant. Right? For, for the, the learner, be it a child or a student, to become independent. And so scaffolding means providing support while somebody learns a skill and then removing it when they no longer need it and applying it to the next higher level. You keep doing that until the learner achieves the level of, of mastery. I don't assume that students, that all students in a class are ready for a midterm final structure. If I structured a course that way, it would make a lot of assumptions. It would assume that all the students are coming in with the skills to read for comprehension, to take notes, to process information deeply, right? To know how to read test questions and what they mean to manage their test anxiety, right? to come forward with and escalate concerns. In fact, those are things that you learn through exposure and practice. And the format that I use in intro courses with a lot of quizzes, it's kind of scaffolding. And I expect that generally great people's grades get better and better as they learn those things. And then maybe, uh, a midterm final format could be something people are ready for once everyone's learned that. Okay, once you can get everyone to a satisfactory level of, of performance. But I wouldn't feel comfortable just throwing people into that format. But maybe some students are ready for that and do well with that format. Children also develop socially. Stranger anxiety is a fear of strangers that infants commonly display. And that doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen with newborn babies. But around eight months, um, if you have a, a baby and you give it to a friend to hold, the baby might get upset and cry and want to mom. Well, attachment refers to an emotional tie with a caregiver. And young children demonstrate that by seeking closeness. If you have a, a child, a child wants to be with you all the time, and they show distress on separation. Infants form attachments, not just because parents 
gratify biological needs because you, you give them food and and a comfy place to sleep but you know because they're comfortable they're familiar they're responsive there's a social and emotional bond harry harlow did some research on that with monkeys and um he wanted to know whether children in this case uh, represented by these baby rhesus monkeys would be attached or attached to a mother figure because of the comfort it provided or because of, of the food. And so he took baby rhesus monkeys away from their mothers and gave them a kind of a fake mother. And it would be covered in cloth and have um, like a milk bottle attached to it and have a face. And then he tried separating the milk bottle. So taking the food and putting it on this much colder and more sterile um, wire mother. He wanted to know what the baby monkeys would do. Would they spend most of their time with the cloth mother or with the wire mother that had the food? Does anyone know what they did? They showed a preference for the cloth mother. And they had serious deficits as they aged. There are critical periods for social development as well as cognitive development. So we see in circumstances of extreme deprivation. So let's say a child that's raised by wolves is never going to develop normal human social skills. We know there's also critical periods for cognitive development, for learning to write, for learning to speak. A strong example of stage development is imprinting. Baby birds of certain species will attach to the first thing that they see. And normally that's the mommy bird. And then they follow the mommy, mommy duck around. And, but that's a, a very hardwired biological process that is actually based on the first thing they see. And if the first thing they see is a researcher like Conrad Lorenz, who's famous for that, um, or a bouncing ball, then they will imprint for that. Conrad Lorenz is the founder of the field of animal behavior. So psychology is the field of really human behavior and mental processes, but psychologists also study animals. It's a bit of an, an overlapping discipline. So you'll find animal behaviorists working in psychology departments. I think Simon Gadwa at Dalhousie works with wolves. With wolves. And uh, Conrad Lorenz was an Austrian psychologist who founded that discipline. He was also a Nazi propagandist. So he did come to, well, he claimed to, to regret those views later in life, but he would have had a very reified idea of, sort of I, I guess, biological races and was races and was a eugenicist. All right. So talk about social development next. The strange situation experiments, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, demonstrate something called attachment. And the experiments demonstrate that some children are securely attached and others are insecurely attached. And we'll talk about what that means. Infants differing attachment styles reflect more than just their temperament. So if uh, there's a happy baby that wants to be with you or a cranky baby that, that doesn't want to be held, that might be more than just the baby's temperament. It might also reflect the responsiveness of their parents or their child care providers. And we know that difficult infants do in fact seem to improve when their parents, when their caregivers are provided with training for good parenting. Early attachment seems to influence later adult relationships, like how comfortable people are with affection, intimacy, commitment, because trust forms in infancy from our experiences with caregivers. And you can learn early on that people uh, represented by your, your family or your caregivers are trustworthy, or you might learn that they're not that they will meet your needs or that they won't. So according to 
this theory, there are four different attachment styles. So there's secure, at, at the, sorry, the di dichotomized level would be secure attachment and insecure attachment. But then there's three kinds of insecure attachment. So in the strange situation test, the child's caregiver leaves the child, and this is a very young child, with a stranger. And the researchers observe how the child reacts when the caregiver is present, when they leave, and when they come back. So what one a securely attached child would relate to the parent as a secure base from which to explore. They'd show distress when the caregiver leaves, but not like extreme distress. Would be comforted by the stranger because we can trust the stranger, but has a preference for the caregiver and is happy when they come back. And that suggests that the caregiver is a consistent, safe person and the child believes they can get their needs met. Now, the avoidant kind of insecure attachment. In that case, the child wouldn't seem to care when the caregiver leaves or returns. This isn't somebody that consistently meets your needs. It's a lack of attachment. Might show little affect when offered affection. They might treat the stranger similarly to the caregiver. Right? The stranger we don't know might be just as good as the caregiver or just as bad. And in that case, the caregiver is theorized to be someone that doesn't meet the child's emotional needs. Maybe the caregiver is distant and disengaged. Now, in the ambivalent type, the child would be clinging, distressed when the caregiver leaves, wary of the stranger, and not comforted by the return of the parent or the caregiver, sorry. And that suggests that the caregiver is inconsistent, sometimes sensitive, right? sometimes available and caring, but sometimes neglectful. And that could leave the child being anxious, angry, insecure. And that child has learned they can't rely on the caregiver to meet their needs. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. It's not the same thing as learning that this person just doesn't meet their needs. Then in the disordered form of insecure attachment, that suggests that the caregiver is abusive or neglectful. So the child might act in a sort of frightening or frightened way. Might seem dazed or confused around the caregiver or show erratic or extreme behavior. And it suggests that the child doesn't have a strategy to have their needs met. They don't know what's going to happen next. Now, I did take this with a grain of salt. When there's the, theory, the theoretical level, we talk about it like it's true. And we can test it. We have to use operational definitions. We do some statistics and, and ask what percentage of the variance in some variable does this actually explain? Now, what if a child had some illness or some that made them seem apprehensive or confused? What if there's some backstory you don't know? What if there's cultural differences? You'd want to be careful about identifying someone as, as an abusive parent based on a, a 20 minute procedure like this. There's reading a lot out of behavior there. There's some evidence that these early attachment styles influence adult relationship. So is a child with an avoidant attachment style going to develop into an adult who say struggles with commitment in a romantic relationship? What happens when a child with a disordered attachment style becomes a parent themselves? Right? How might they treat their child? Deprivation of attachment can be very harmful, but I want to acknowledge that most children are in fact very resilient. So most children, the majority of children who grow up in adversity or experiencing abuse are resilient and kind of turn out well in the end. 
However, that certainly doesn't justify um, depriving a child of the right kind of circumstances it needs to foster healthy development. There's something called the stress diastasis model. Have you guys ever heard of that? Maybe in biology? It's the idea that you might have a predisposition to develop some condition. Maybe you are, let's say, predisposed because of your family heritage to develop heart disease. But maybe it takes a certain stressor or a certain amount of stress to push you into actually developing that. If, let's say maybe you have a really healthy lifestyle and you go for a jog every day and live on vegetables, maybe, maybe you won't develop heart disease. But let's say you have that vulnerability and you have a really high stress lifestyle and a really unhealthy diet, maybe that will kind of push you over the edge. So the idea that you need two things, you need the, the vulnerability and then you need the stressor. And a deprived environment is certainly very stressful, so it makes sense that it might trigger the development of pathologies. So children who suffer from severe, prolonged abuse or neglect are at risk for attachment problems, developmental delay, especially if they're not getting the exposures they need to, um, to learn the things they need to learn by their critical period. So if a child's not given the opportunity to read, well, let's say it passes puberty, might have lost that opportunity. Develop health problems, psychological disorders, substance use, and social issues, Just high rates of criminality. They might grow up to mistreat other people in their lives because they haven't learned how to treat people well. There was an unfortunate natural experiment on social deprivation in children in Romania. Romania had a communist dictator whose name I do not know how to pronounce. He had some pretty terrible policies and they resulted in serious overpopulation. So people were having more children than they could actually provide for and were giving them up to orphanages, which were overrun and children outnumbered caregivers by 15 to one. Could you imagine working at, let's say an orphanage like this and being responsible for 15 children? Right, that's, that's not gonna work. And that's an example of low quality care, just not enough resources to provide for the children. And that led to um, reduced cognitive development and abnormal stress responses and more psychopathology. When somebody does something wrong, when somebody hurts us, it's very natural to say, how could they do that thing? More difficult question is what happened to them to make them do that thing? Research with golden hamsters that are repeatedly attacked when they're young shows that once they become adults, when they're put in cages with same sized or larger hamsters, they cower, they act like cowards. But when they're placed with smaller hamsters, they act like bullies. So what do children need? Well, most of the research on that is done on mothers and, and what kind of behavior should the mothers show. There's less of um, a focus on fathers, but a father's love predicts a child's well-being just as well. Research suggests that Children do best um, when raised by two parents. There are a lot of stressors and limited resources that uh, say um, a single mother might face. But what really ultimately matters is that children need competent, secure, and nurturing caregivers. Right? That is what needs to happen, however it happens. And maybe that's in a conventional suburban nuclear family or maybe there's two dads, or maybe it's a single mom and her awesome support network. Maybe it's the whole village. Maybe it's some close-knit religious community, whatever it is, whatever the arrangement is, and there are many and there are varied. What matters is that children have competent, secure, nurturing caregivers. The ideal parent 
provides a secure base from which the child can explore and then run back to when they're distressed, a safe haven. Okay? The ideal parent's actions say, I'll be here for you. I care about you. I'm interested in you. And come what may, I'll be there for you. With maturation, that base shifts from parents to your friend group, maybe to a long-term partner. And it's the function, it's reflected in the sort of perceived relationship that some people have with, with God. That's a, that, that relationship is a very parent-child-based relationship. So that sense of trust develops into um, the construct of faith. There are four parenting styles according to a two by two matrix. So we can have um, something, I'm not sure what word is right for it, but something like it's more than control. I don't know if it's demandingness. Right word. Things like setting expectations. versus just having no rules. And then you can have another axis that's something like warmth. So responsiveness maybe. So maybe this is warm, maybe this is colder. So let's say you have a parent that has kind of really low on demanding us or low on providing structure, but they're still really nice. We could call that permissive. And permissive parents would set, make few demands, set few limits, use little punishment. This is kind of, I love you when you can do whatever you want. And then imagine if we had that, but we took away the warmth. Then you'd have an, a negligent and neglectful parent. And this is probably the worst. Now, um, let's say that you have a parent that provides structure and sets expectations, and they have more warmth, more of a democratic style, demanding and responsive, right? But they would encourage open discussion of rules and make exception. That's authoritative. Now there could be a colder version of that where the rules are the rules. Sorry, go to your room. And that would be um, authoritarian. So authoritarian parents would impose rules and expect obedience. And if you break the rules, you're in a lot of trouble. There are, um, different outcomes for these different parenting styles. Um, I don't think that you know, negligent parenting is ever gonna work. In this society, children with the highest self-concept, self-reliance, self-regulation, and social competence generally have authoritative parents. So in, in our society, it's kind of the, the ideal parenting type. But I wanna say that context matters. So authoritative parenting, there's a lot of discussion, might work well in a safe, democratic kind of society. But if it's a war zone outside, maybe a more authoritarian style would work better, right? If there's less room for taking chances and, and for learning. But um, children who have neglectful parents tend to have poor social outcomes, poor academic outcomes. And 
parents of permissive, sorry, children of permissive parents tend to be more immature and more aggressive. So now I'm gonna leave this content and move to self-concept. So your sense of self is also something that develops. Okay, self-concept refers to all our thoughts and feelings about yourself that answers the question, who am I? And you might expect that a baby has a very different self-concept or sense of self than a child, than a teenager, than somebody looking back at the end of their life. Now, at around six months, children can recognize themselves in a mirror. That's one way we can discern whether people have some self-concept. What happens when a cat sees itself in the mirror? Does it get scared of itself? Or, or like it might attack mm -hmm. or think it's another cat. The cat does not get that that is itself. And that suggests that maybe cats don't have a self-concept. Or maybe they do and it just can't be measured that way. But if you were to, let's say, put a red dot on a chimpanzee's forehead, say the chimpanzee doesn't know you did that, and the chimpanzee's used to looking itself in a mirror, what a chimp will actually do is be like, what is that? And it will touch itself. And that suggests that it knows this reflection is a representation of itself, and it therefore has some self-concept. Humans can do that at six months. Around 15 to 18 months, um, they have a, a scheme and idea of how their, their face should look. It can, that self-concept continues to develop. In the school age, kids have a more detailed understanding of things like gender, like I'm, I'm a girl and I play with the girls, and those are the boys and we run away from them. And they have a sense of group membership, of psychological traits, of peer comparison, I would say. Um, uh, Ivy is good at art and Bobby is good at math. And you know, I like to skate and you like something else. So they're kind of working out those higher level descriptions there that are based on gender, interests, activities. Self-image becomes a lot more stable around eight to 10 years. Having a more stable self-concept is linked to independence, to, optimi to optimism, confidence, sociability, and all this research is done in individualistic cultures. Self-concept would, um, would expect that to be affected by autistic spectrum disorder, by any condition that impairs someone's ability to recognize themselves as distinct from others. Are there any questions? No, how are you guys doing? Get a show of hands for red, orange. You're doing good, great, on track to meet your goals. About the stamp pat, okay. Is that 25%-ish? Okay, hanging in there. About the same. Anyone feel like we need more support or shift? No, okay. Um, please, uh, yeah, reach out if you have any questions or comments. I'm ending a little early today because uh, I didn't know how to fit adolescence in. I thought it might go better with, uh, with adulthood than infancy and childhood. So maybe I shouldn't have done that, but um, we're committed now. And so you have those two modules and the chapter on time management from Feldman and Lavoie. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday.